Greetings and welcome to today's educational program entitled Building an Organizational Culture that is Committed to Excellence. This is Kurt Stuck with the ASQ Quality Management Division joining you from beautiful Kentuckook, New Hampshire where the temperature has dived, I don't know, 10 degrees in the past hour, I think. Um, today's program is being recorded. Any views expressed in this webinar are for general educational purposes only and do not represent any official views or positions of the sponsoring or presenters organizations. A video recording link of today's program will be available later today via email. You will receive an email 24 hours after the webinar documenting your recertification units or RUs for attending this event. We're looking forward to your great comments and questions during the program and we invite you to please quiet the cell phone, close the door, warm up your fingers and give us your great input through the Q&A uh, function at the, located at the bottom and the right hand of your screen unless of course you moved it. So today we have the pleasure of hearing from Don Ringrose. Don has consulted in management in areas that positively contribute to organizational performance since 1984, a wide range of academic qualifications, professional certifications, and practical experience have contributed to her subject matter expertise in organizational excellence. She has worked across sectors with different size organizations to improve performance, and several of these organizations have earned national excellence awards. With a strong desire to transfer what she has learned to others, Dawn has developed a turnkey toolkit that is designed to make the excellence journey more simple, straightforward, time efficient, and cost effective. She was pleased to lead the first global assessment of the current state of organizational excellence that was launched by the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee, QMD ASQ, and supported by the Global Benchmarking Network, International Academy for Quality, ISO Tech Committee 176, and over 400 researchers around the world. Don owns and operates Organizational Excellence Specialists Incorporated in Canada and currently serves on the board of the Global Benchmarking Network, the executive team of the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee, QMD ASQ, and as chair of the Leadership Content Management Committee at QMD ASQ. She has presented her work at international conferences and published in international management journals and peer-reviewed newsletters, including Global Benchmarking Network, Business Process Improvement Resource, Center for Organizational Excellence Research, Quality Management Forum, and South African Quality Institute. So without further ado, Don, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Kurt. You're welcome. And hello, everybody. I'm so pleased to see that we've got a great group here tonight. And I'm really looking forward to sharing my thoughts on building an organizational culture that is committed to excellence with you this evening. You know, culture of excellence is really a hot topic these days. I've noticed that there's a lot of professionals talking about it. There's a lot of organizations speaking about it too. But what does it mean? We're going to take a good close look at that tonight and uh, we're kind of going to cover off these learning objectives. In fact, in this webinar, I'm going to try to answer four questions. Number one, what is a culture committed to excellence? What principles characterize organizations that have this? Why is a culture committed to excellence important? I think the best way we can answer that question is to listen to some stories about several organizations that have done work in this respect. Third question, how do we assess the culture of excellence in an organization? I'm going to share some methodology that we use at my firm and the real-time results for the global research study that Kurt mentioned er earlier. And so we'll take a look at what's going on around the world. And the fourth question, what can we do to improve the culture of excellence? This is where, again, I'm going to share some methodology about how we can apply what we've learned so that you can take a, a look at this uh, in your own organization and actively work to improve it. So our first question, what is a culture committed to excellence? Based on global research over the last 25 years with high performing organizations, uh, excellence models have defined the principles of excellence. And these principles describe the culture of the organization, the way that people work with each other and their stakeholders, such as customers, suppliers, partners, and the like. 
And there's basically nine principles. We have leader involvement, ensuring that senior management is committed and actively involved in establishing and communicating direction. We have good alignment, and this is the understanding the organization is a system of interrelated and interconnected work processes, and all activities need to be aligned with the established direction. There's a focus on the customer, and these organizations ensure that everyone in the organization understands and meets the needs of the customer. People involvement, and this is where, of course, we nurture and reinforce cooperation and teamwork and give employees the opportunity to develop to their full potential. Prevention-based process management is establishing that consistency in work processes and developing a mindset of prevention. Partnership development is developing and maintaining value-adding relationships with suppliers and partners. And continuous improvement is harnessing all that collective knowledge, skills, and creativity of employees and other stakeholders to relentlessly pursue improvement. Database decision-making is basing our decisions on performance measurement findings. And societal commitment is striving to understand and demonstrate corporate commitment to society. So why is a, a culture committed to excellence important? The stories that I'd like to tell you provide some examples. And with each one of these, just sit back and listen and reflect on those principles that I just shared and see if you can, you can see and, and, and hear the principles that these organizations have, have worked so hard on. Now, some of these stories can be found on ASQ TV, and others are based on experiences that I've had. But all of them sit within the tourism and hospitality sector. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting just to focus in on one particular sector. The, the Ritz-Carlton, um, they take a, a look at empowering their employees uh, so that they can lead a, a solid quality culture and increase the bottom line results. So there's, uh, people are, are heavily involved. And the hotel chain refers to their employees as ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen, which shows a real customer focus mindset. Uh, those of you probably are familiar with Ritz Carlton, you know it's a luxury brand. And the employees at uh, the hotel chain pay special attention to every detail so that every moment created for the customer reflects the brand and is a memorable one. In fact, if you take a look at kind of some of the hard work that they've done, they've taken a look at all of the issues that are related to checking into the hotel and holding a meeting and analyzed all these issues and made changes to their work processes to prevent the issues from occurring again. So real good demonstration of prevention-based process management. And to deliver this level of service consistently, they have implemented an excellence model and done a lot of benchmarking with other organizations that are high performing when it comes to communicating with people. So this is an area where they've, uh, they've made a, you know, additional effort. Now there's a hotel chain in Canada, Delta Hotels, that has really enjoyed improving levels of performance since implementing an excellence model. And this occurred over quite a number of years, but they really stand out from other hotels in the industry in Canada with their exceptional ratings that they've earned across a balanced system of measurement. And they're a hotel chain that receives quite a number of applications for employment every month. They have, it's such a wonderful place to work. And a number of years ago, I spoke to quite a number of the general managers at uh, several of the Delta hotels about using the excellence model. And each one of them really reinforced the importance of developing a culture committed to excellence. And when I asked them about the best thing about implementing the model, each one of the GMs mentioned something a little bit different. You know, some talked about leadership involvement, others talked about focus on the customer, uh, and, and so forth. So it was very interesting how it kind of covered across all of the principles. But the overall strategy at this hotel chain is to attract, engage, and retain people and to also ensure that their processes are effective and they're continually improving. Their website's a very powerful tool for recruitment, and they use the video clips of the CEO, pictures of people, and employee testimonials uh, as, as a way of inviting people to come work with the organization. 
they're all selling those jobs and experiences, in other words. They've got a very flat organization, and the employees are empowered to make decisions that affect themselves or the customers. And the employees are welcome to talk to the CEO anytime. Mid-managers communicate brand, culture, and strategy to frontline staff. And they're in a habit of holding quarterly town hall meetings so they can share information with employees, get people talking and generating ideas. And they have a quarterly newsletter that shares successes. At Travelocity and Kayak, uh, Terry Jones has talked about the importance of listening to the customer when building quality into their service. He originally worked at American Airlines in the Sabre division where they were developing a prototype for Travelocity. And he had to move out of the building as they needed to grow and be able to move quickly. They needed to have a really high speed culture because working with a web business, he said it's all about prototyping, testing, failing, learning. And if you develop a culture that's focused on the customer, it accelerates quality. And he gave a really interesting example of, of just what that means, focusing on the customer. And he talked about a customer email coming in, sharing a concern, and how that email was given right to the programmer. And the solution there was to give pain to the people that caused the pain. So the programmer had to turn around, feel that customer's pain, and then adjust the product to meet the customer's requirements. So a great example of customer focus and people involvement. And at West Edmonton Mall, uh, I had the pleasure of, of working on and off with this organization over quite a number of years as they implemented an excellence model. And I really saw them demonstrate quite a number of, of these principles. They had a general manager that used to spend a half a day each month in the shoes of employees, really demonstrating that leadership involvement. They had good alignment in the organization between their strategic plan their business plan, employee performance plan, the reward and recognition program that supported the goals and objectives. They even had an advisory board that included children and provided feedback on their parks and attractions. So that's really showing a focus on the customer. They trained and developed employees and included them in improvement initiatives. And they worked with their promotional partners in the hospitality and tourism industry on all sorts of of different sorts of undertakings. And they worked with a few trusted suppliers uh, to do the work that they did. And a great example of partnership development. And in their commitment to putting an excellence model in place, they conducted annual assessments to build on strengths and address the opportunities for improvement. So a real dedication to continuous improvement. And of course, they showed great societal commitment in the way they gave back to the community through donations of things like attraction passes or volunteer hours. And here's one last example, Ben & Jerry's, great ice cream company. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with their ice cream. They made a conscious decision to make fun an official part of the company culture. In fact, they started the Joy Gang back in 1987 in response to the increasing demands upon their employees. The company was getting busy and people were really working long hours. And some of the first joy activities included things like pizza and 15 minute massages for their manufacturing employees who were working really long shifts. And their mission was just to infuse joy into everything that the company did. And they basically used three approaches. They had joy grants were cash grants up to $500 to accommodate an idea that would bring more joy to a particular department. Things like bringing hot cocoa machine for the freezer crew or a stereo for the production crew. They had joy events, which were planned, announced, and organized activities that were sponsored. Things like National Clash Dressing Day that included food, fun, and prizes. And then the third approach was having the joy guerrilla tactics. And these were secretive activities that aren't disclosed, which are intended to surprise employees. Things like all of a sudden an announcement that there's gonna be pizza and putting at a miniature golf course and off they go. So how do we assess the culture of excellence in an organization? At my firm, we use a very subjective method to uh, assess uh, the organizational culture. It's a subjective scale, kind of your gut feel, low, medium, high, 
to what extent does this principle describe the culture in our organization? And we ask all the employees that are willing to weigh in uh, to self-assess using this scale against the nine principles and provide open-ended comments on where they think the organization is doing well or where there's opportunities to improve. And we take that, uh, those assessments and we compile and aggregate the findings to take a look at where they're scoring high, lower, and focus in on where the improvement activities should be. That sort of feedback gives us a real good sense of the culture in the organization. And actually, the ratings are one thing, but I find the open-ended comments are wonderful because they really provide the rationale for the ratings and they reveal an awful lot more about what's going on behind the scenes. And out of that really come some great ideas and, and improvement opportunities. Now, once you've established what the culture of excellence is in an organization, we want to see how it measures you measure up to other organizations. And this is where this first global assessment study comes in. This was a study doing that was done over a four-year period. And we recruited over 400 researchers around the world that all volunteered their time to invite organizations to respond on behalf of their organization so we could get a feel on the culture of excellence in their organization and also the deployment of best management practices that are found in an excellence model. But we had uh, 791 respondents that completed the what we call the teaser assessment only on the principles. And this really provided a good snapshot on the culture of excellence around the world. The respondents uh, really captured a nice cross-section of the working population, various roles in organizations, such as leadership, management, and staff. There were different size organizations from micro, small, to medium, and large different types of organizations from business, government, nonprofit. All 21 industry sectors were represented and seven regions of the world. And so here's a, a look at some of the results. Tells us a little bit about what's going on in organizations around the world. Here was the overall aggregate ratings. And uh, this chart shows the overall results results, and you can see that the most highly rated principles were focus on the customer and leadership involvement. And the lowest rated principles were prevention-based process management and data-based decision making. Leadership had a tendency to rate the principles slightly higher than the other roles. And this was particularly evident when, when rating uh, leadership involvement, where you know, leadership was the highest, management came next, and staff uh, came after that. And the other category, which may have represented board members and things like that, uh, they gave the, the lowest rating on, on leadership involvement. Uh, continuous improvement, we saw a similar trend where the ratings were higher coming from leadership followed by management staff. We take a look at uh, organizations by type, and business organizations provided the highest rating on the principles, followed closely by the nonprofit and government organizations. And this tendency persisted across the nine principles, with the exception of continuous improvement, where business and nonprofit ratings were the same, and on societal improvement, where of course you might expect the nonprofit organizations had the highest rating. When we take a look at the different size of organizations, micro size organizations, which have anywhere from one to 25 employees, provided the highest rating on the principles, followed by their large, small, and medium sized counterparts. And this tendency persisted across the nine principles. When we took a look at general industry sector, and that's service and manufacturing, it, uh, the service sector had a tendency to rate the principles higher than the manufacturing sector. And the only exception was the principle of partnership development, where the ratings were equal. When we took a look at specific industry sector, 
And this is where we got a higher number of responses were from these sectors that are listed down the left-hand side of the chart. We found that the professional, scientific, and technical sector and the financial and insurance sector had the highest overall rating. And on the other end of the scale was construction and public administration with the lowest ratings. On the individual principles, the highest ratings uh, were for leadership involvement, for the professional, scientific, and technical sector, and for the financial and insurance sector. And if we take a look at the lowest rated principles, we found prevention-based process management and database decision making were the lowest for the public administration or government sector, and also database decision making for the construction sector. Taking a look at region of the world, and these regions are based on the World uh, Analytical Bank grouping. Um, it was it was pretty close, you know, as you as you take a look through the the aggregate scores. But the principles were rated highest by organizations in East Asia and Pacific, and also the Sub-Saharan Africa regions, and slightly lower in the remaining regions. Some of the higher points included uh, East Asia and Pacific, where they rated uh, leadership involvement and focus on the customer quite a bit higher than the rest. And uh, on the low end, um, we saw some of the lowest scores coming from North America on prevention-based process management, and also from Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, lower ratings on database decision making. As we look through all of the comments on uh, in this study, and I'll say, I'll just tell you behind the scenes, there was there are 200 pages of open-ended comments, but uh, we saw some really great comments that really gave us a feel for what was going on in organizations. And comments like this one, uh, where where the individual said that uh, doing this assessment just gave them, you know, really reinforced that their company was really operating on quite an odd hoc ad hoc and unstructured basis, and that, that that's probably the reason why they were, you know, slightly adrift, they said at the moment. So what can we do to improve the culture of excellence? We have, now we've captured the current state uh, in our organization. We've compared it to others by taking a look at uh, the results on the global assessment study. Um, which are readily available on our on our website, and we've we've shared them also on the LinkedIn site for the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee, and and through ASQ. But what can we do to improve the low-rated principles? And this is where it's really un important to understand the interrelationships, how interrelated and interconnected the principles and the best management practices are in the excellence model and all the points at which they, they have these touch points, really direct relationships, because uh, the, the principles are directly related to the best management practices, and, and they, we, we know over time through the research that putting these practices in place do indeed influence the principles. So I've created a handy chart and probably can't see it very well where you are on your computer screens, but you can download it off the homepage of, a, of our website. It's called Interrelationships. And it's a great little chart to use it as a diagnostic. And what it has running along the top are the nine principles. And running down the left-hand side of the chart are all of these best management practices in nine key management areas. And there's quite a few quite a few practices. And so what you want to do is you simply want to record the average ratings for your organization uh, underneath the principles and alongside all of the practices. And for the principles along the top that have a, especially, a, you know, a lower rating, then you want to scan down the chart through all the best practices, find the touch points, and also pay attention to where you have a corresponding low rating. So at those touch points where you've got a low rating on the principal, a low rating on one of the directly related practices, this is an indication of, of where you should concentrate effort. And I don't know if some of you are noticing that we're now issuing follow-on reports from this global assessment and, and we're capturing 
really great little snapshots of particular countries that were high responding. So we can take a closer look because we've got more data to work with on each of these countries. And it's giving you, you a view of what's going on uh, in organizations in those countries with the culture of excellence in their organizations. Now, if you take a look at this chart, there's about 50 practices that apply to micro-sized organizations. There's about 100 practices that are, apply to larger size uh, organizations. And, and there's quite a number of touch points. And so if we just take the larger organizations, you know, any organizations that, let's say, have got 26 or more employees, um, this is where we can take a look at all these touch points that exist between the principles and the practices. And on this slide, I've identified that. How many practices are related to leadership involvement, alignment, focus on the customer, people involvement, and so forth? And so it's very interesting when you take a look at all the touch points and all the influences back and forth in an excellence model uh, on these uh, principles. And you can get a better idea uh, and, you know, much more definitive idea of these interrelationships if you want to download the Organizational Excellence Framework publication and the Interrelationships document. Both of them are available at, at no charge on the, on the home page of, of the website, and that address is provided there at the bottom of the screen. The intention there is really to share this knowledge with others because, you know, our global research tells us that only about 20% of the working population is familiar with excellence models, so it's really important uh, that we get this information out there and, you know, people can use these documents as a good reference and for their additional professional development. But under each of the practices, it'll note where, what the related the principles are and under all the principles, what those related practices are. So it's a very interesting study. So what else can you do to improve the culture of excellence in your organization? Here's a few ideas. You can do the larger assessment that gives you a good feel, of course, for um, how the deployment of all the practices in, in your organization and then take a look at improvement planning. So not only what can you do to improve the low-rated principles, but what about those interrelationships? What about some of those low-rated practices that need some work too? You can sit down with people in the organization and have meetings, uh, gather ideas and suggestions. You can offer workshops on the topic especially if you've done the work in your organization to all do a self-assessment on the culture. And then you can take a look at those results and have a good discussion about it. And then a little extra learning in these workshops. You can conduct site visits with other organizations that are known to have uh, a culture that's committed to excellence. And good examples of those are a lot of organizations around the world that have earned excellence awards, national excellence awards. There's lots of great examples. And so you can take a look at, uh, at those organizations. Maybe it's their, their applications, or maybe they've done video clips. Maybe you can have a conversation with their, their excellence manager. Bring that information back to the employees in your organization and have a good discussion about it. And if you're lucky, get, you know, go on a site visit and tour around. And of course, learning from these other organizations is just absolutely uh, in, invaluable. Um, you know, I think most of the time we see that about 90% of the uh, improvement ideas uh, come from people within the organization, but there's an extra 10% that you can really get by learning uh, from others, looking outside of your organization at the examples set by others. So all of this is very, very important because this uh, formula for success, this is something I found over, over time working with excellence models. Um, the culture of uh, committed to excellence is very, very important. And I think it's really important for people to know that when you implement the best management practices in an excellence model, you develop a culture committed to excellence. And from that, you go on to achieve exceptional results across a balanced system of measurement. It's tried and true, and there's over 25 years of global research um, that has validated that this formula 
exists, and my personal experience with working with a wide variety of organizations over a similar time period has, has validated uh, that it's really quite formulaic. And a lot of organizations, when you first do a self-assessment with them, you'll find that they've got a lot of these, the, you know, they're doing not bad on the principles and they've got a lot of these practices in place and it's just a matter of, of working on those, uh, you know, building on the strengths that they've already got there in place and addressing the, the opportunities for improvement or in things, areas where they haven't been doing much work or they need to do a little bit more uh, so that over time they get to enjoy this formula for success as well. Here's some next step ideas for um, all of you here is, is to, you know, visit our website where we give a good background on this uh, global study that we did, this first global assessment on the current state of organizational excellence. It's funny that that's never been done before. In the whole history of excellence models, you know, they've been around since around 1990, and it, it's never been done before to kind of capture the current state of what's really going on in organizations by size, industry, sector, and, and region or country. And it, uh, this snapshot really gives us a nice view. And, and so that when, when we assess the culture of excellence on our organization, we can see not only how we measure up, but how we compare to other organizations, the, the average bear out there. And uh, you can read that final report on the global research study to, to make those comparisons and compare your ratings with others. And do, then go ahead to do the work on the low rated principles. And, uh, and go on if you wish to do a full assessment and, and take a look at what you can do in the, in the practices that, that influence these, these principles. And as I pointed out earlier, learn from uh, high-performing organizations. So you want that internal look and you want that external look. But this, to me, uh, we've got everything we need uh, out in the marketplace today amongst what we do in the quality and the excellence community. We've got these tools to assess our current state and see how we measure up. We now have this study that's given us a good view, and we'll keep this study going. So we'll have a good view on what's going on on average in organizations around the world by size, industry, sector, and, and region or country. And, and then the next step is to, you know, we do our work in our organizations to improve, but our next step is to shoot for the stars, compare ourselves to the higher performing organizations, those that climbed the mountain and reached the pinnacle, um, those organizations that let's say have earned excellence awards. And, uh, and this, this allows us to, to get a shoot for that pinnacle, walk up that mountain to become high performing, just like those other organizations. So we have really all the ingredients that we need for that recipe for success right here at our fingertips today. So just a little bit of a summary before we turn it over to uh, questions and answers. This session I've tried to describe the principles, the nine principles that characterize the culture of excellence and given you a pretty high level description of them. There's much more detailed description in the Organizational Excellence Framework publication because it, it that publication not only defines the principles uh, but it'll, it'll talk about those related uh, practices. And for the practices, it defines those practices, but it also, it also gives you a view to the methodology and the implementation guidelines for putting them in place. And again, the interrelationships of those practices with the, uh, with the principles. So um, this, also in this session, we've talked about those stories. Uh, the tools that we can use, the methodology we can use to get uh, a snapshot on the culture of excellence in our organization. And I hope you take advantage of the opportunity on the previous slide about uh, taking that, that hands-on opportunity really to self-assess your culture or use the, this tool to work with people in your organization to self-assess the culture. On, on our website, you can get a confidential feedback report, uh, which it makes it much easier for you to, to diagnose kind of where you're at and what to do about it. Um, but then there's those global research results for comparison uh, as well. 
and we've showed where the culture of excellence fits into the for formula for success. Uh, so again, good idea to take a look at where you are in the whole scheme of things uh, in terms of, you know, to what extent have you implemented these best practices? To what extent do you have a culture committed to excellence? And, uh, and how are you doing on achieving those exceptional results? Really, the culture of excellence is at the heart of an awful lot of this because it's the people that really make all this happen. It's the hard work of people in organizations um, that put those practices in place, get the work done, achieve those results. And uh, it's very important that you understand the basic building blocks and how this, this uh, all, all goes together. So with that, I'd just like to pause here and, and thank you, you know, for your kind attention, um, recognizing that this is a pretty hot topic these days, and I wanted to leave lots of time for questions so that uh, we can answer any questions that you've got and perhaps have a good discussion here uh, with the numbers of people that we have here tonight. We've got close to 200 people, so this gives us wonderful opportunity to get through all the questions. So, Don, this is Kurt. Hello. Nice job. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, Don? Yes. All right. <laughs> so what I'd suggest is I have some of the questions in the Q&A tab, and I'll read them to you, and perhaps you could extemporaneously respond to the questions. And I hope the question, questioners themselves don't mind. But here's number one. Where would you start? Where would one start in implementing the best management practices specifically? Do you have a response? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I would say the, when you take a look at the Organizational Excellence Framework publication uh, and you take a look at the, the list of the practices in each of the key management areas, there's nine key management areas, things like governance and leadership and customers and so forth. Um, each one of those practices, you know, they're, they're in chronological order uh, for the most part. So I think where I think it's a good place to start um, is if you're taking a look at the culture of excellence in your organization, just start simply with those nine principles and that subjective rating scale. You know, how are we doing? Where are we at in terms of our culture of excellence? And, and taking a look at those interrelationships things that are influencing the ratings, any open-ended comments maybe that people in your organization have. That's the first step. Uh, and, then, and then you can, you can increase the level of complexity by doing you know, a full assessment if you want to get feedback on all these best management practices as well. But I think starting with that teaser assessment is, is wonderful. It gives you really good feedback on your organization. Great, thank you. The next question is, how do the principles and the practices for excellence, as you've laid out here, compare to the Baldrige? Well, this is a, this is a great question. I love that. Um, in the Appendix 1 in the publication, I've, you see, what I did with this publication is I integrated uh, everything that, all the good work that's been done to date with the, the four original excellence models on which everything else has been based around the world. And those four excellence models were Baldrige, ESQM, the Canadian Framework, and the Australian Framework. And so in this Appendix 1, I lay out all these principles and best management practices that are in the Organizational Excellence Framework, and I've got columns out to the right-hand side for these original or leading models. And so you can see what is covered in those models and what is not. And so you can see very clearly um, that there are some gaps out there. And, and that, that was the beauty of combining everything. I thought, let's have everything in, in one place. And the other thing I, I thought was beneficial is no one had ever written anything on, on how do you implement all these practices uh, or anything about the interrelationships between the principles and practices. And so I thought there was an opportunity to, to write all that up for the benefit uh, of others. And so this publication includes those implementation guidelines and interrelationships as well. So it's just a great reference, and it's really meant to be applied to work with any excellence model. doesn't matter if you're 
using Baldrige or EFQM or any of the wonderful excellence models that we have around the world. This is just a good reference and it's a, basically it's a, the what is of excellence and the how to in terms of uh, implementation. Great, great, thank you. Uh, interesting question. Suggestions for implementing this within a teleworking environment versus the face-to-face -face environment. Is it possible? Oh, I think so. You know, I um, we just did an interesting session, our own team, uh, because we're located all over the world, and this is how we operate. You know, we operate in a virtual world, and uh, we just, uh, so we did uh, an assessment of sorts of the organization and uh, are moving forward on, you know, goals and objectives that came out of that, but we often, with clients, I'm finding more and more a transition to online work. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago, the preference was for you to come into the organization and workshop this sort of thing with uh, a management team or leadership team or a good cross section of the organization or everyone in the organization. And we'd spend, you know, a few days in these in these workshops. But I'm finding with the pace at which things are occurring. And particularly here in North America, I'm hearing more and more uh, client organizations say that we want to do as much of this online as possible. So we do workshops online, we do online assessments, we aggregate the results, we'll present the results back, share the reports, and assign out um, the improvement uh, activities to the employees in the organization so that they're very uh, engaged and actively involved because that will help accelerate a move to a culture committed to excellence too, the more you engage and involve people. So this is, this is the way we seem to be working these days. Now that said, there are other uh, environments in which we're working uh, where, and these are other, you know, other cultures where people really enjoy um, getting together and sitting down and, uh, and you know, spending time in a, in a workshop. So we do see the difference in in different cultures around the world, and the, and the preference here. And it's somewhat related too, is kind of where they're at in the whole scheme of things in excellence. If they're kind of new to excellence, the tendency is probably want to spend a bit more time in a in a workshop uh, setting all together. Uh, but if if they feel like they're a little bit more sophisticated, then uh, then the online environment just works. Uh, beautifully. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, have you seen um, any significant difference in the subjectivity of the subjective level of organization, organizational responses to the cultural assessment? And hey, if that's true, if there is some difference, how often should you start tapping into this this assessment of yours? Yeah. Yeah, you know what I find fascinating when I do this work with an organization and you've got everybody weighing in um, and we aggregate, you know, the results and we can take a look behind the scenes um, at, you know, where's leadership and management and staff or that other category, let's say, if board, board members are weighing in. Um, we see these, these differences and, and it's, you study it and, and you can understand maybe the why for the differences too. So that in itself is very interesting. I, and we also look at the variance in, in the scores in organizations. So what's that range in scores on, on each of these uh, principles? And sometimes in organizations that are rather new to excellence, uh, the variance can be quite high in the scores. But um, when an organization has been you know, committed to this excellence journey and doing work in that regard and they're engaged and involved and they're talking about it and, uh, and they, know, they know where they're at year after year after year and where they're going, uh, you see that uh, variant, variance becomes much smaller. And so that is an, an, an interesting, something interesting I've noticed. And the other thing I noticed with regards to doing the global assessment is that when you use these subjective scale, to rate the principles that describe the culture, um, respondents had a tendency to rate um, quite positively the culture of excellence in their organizations. But then when they go on the full assessment where they also took a look at how they rated 
all the best management practices across the key management area, the the ratings dropped significantly, you know, by one or two points. Hmm. And it was like that's where the rubber hits the road, you know. It's yeah. where they dive down deeper and they really take a closer look at everything that they're doing in their organization. And and those ratings tell us an awful lot too. And all their open-ended comments. It's um it's such a rich source of information. Um, that's what I love about either doing this in a workshop setting or doing it with the online assessments. You get this rich source of comments that really give you a, quite a detailed view about what's going on in an organization, why the ratings are the way they are, what the differences might be, let's say, between roles and, uh, and so forth. It's uh, absolutely fascinating. Interesting. Thank you. Mm. Um, Someone has asked, can we get the present state of industry or companies that are participating in, in Canada? And my guess is your website mm -hmm. would probably have some data for that, correct? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, right now, this, um, this, the full study, uh, it's got the aggregate ratings, you know, for, um, you know, the study. And it, uh, it doesn't really share on a country by country basis, but there were several very high responding countries. Canada was amongst them. US was as well for your interest. India was as well. Um, and they're listed in, in the report. And so what we're doing now is we're creating more detailed snapshots from some of these high responding countries. So we're doing um, a, a, just a quick two, three page blog that captures the essence of the results for that country. And then of our research team members, um, they're working on more detailed presentations, and so they'll be for the, each country of these high-responding high countries. So they'll be making presentations in their in their country to dive into the more detailed results. And uh, and then we've been talking too about you know sharing some of those results with audiences and and getting people together at conferences to discuss well why are the results the way they are and what can we do about them. Uh, so there's quite a bit of work going on, uh, you know, building on on this work that's been done, and we haven't finished sharing the snapshots yet. We've we've shared uh, snapshots uh, so far for for Canada and Greece and Tanzania, uh, and I should have uh, India out shortly, and then we'll we'll be working on the United States. And so it's really fascinating uh, to see where each country is at. You know, absolutely amazing. So it's I'm I'm really pleased to be able to share those over the or course of the upcoming year and work with the researchers to um, to get out there and make these presentations. And these presentations will be made for ASQ audiences. Excellent. And let's just hypothetically say we're not going to get to all the questions. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for someone to shoot you an email at that email that's listed at the bottom of the screen right now? Oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah. So, I welcome that. Yeah. So my guess is we have some questions coming in through the Q&A tab and through the private chat that are directed to uh, the hosts. So if we don't get your question immediately, right, we will, I, with Don, I will go over the questions that are in the chat room. So please hang in there. We're, we're not trying to ignore you. This is just a high volume. And honestly, those little chat windows are hard to read. So just please be bear with us, patience, please. Um, here's a great question. Recommendations for goal setting at an organizational or company level. High level question. Yeah, the, um, you know, that's the one thing that uh, some organizations use this almost like, a, you know, a, a planning tool where every year they do an assessment, a full assessment. And they come away with a view, you know, a snapshot of their culture, a snapshot of the extent to which these best practices are deployed, and and they're taking a look at, at the results. You know, if they're measuring, uh, they got a nice balanced system of measurement, and they're, they're taking a look at, at the results. Well, all of that is fantastic information for then taking a look at what do they need to work on in the upcoming year and translating that into goals and objectives. And, and aligning it with their strategic imperatives. Um, one of our, our clients uh, just coming to mind that we've been working with for a while now, and they do this assessment now, they've done it for three years, and they align all, we align all of this up with their five strategic pillars. Now, and, it's, forgive yeah. me, but, but the next question is, how do you sell to leadership team? And I, I think you're broaching that subject. 
Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, this is what this is what's really important I think for quality professionals. Um is that you take a look at this from a strategic standpoint. You know, what's the organization's vision, mission, goals and objectives? You know, what are their strategic imperatives? How do you map this against what the the leadership wants to do, where it wants to take the organization this year, the next, the year after that? And and you can show how doing this will help them achieve their goals. You know, for for me, when we do this sort of work with organizations and we, and we help them get great results, it's all about, you know, everybody looking good at the end of the day and helping leadership uh, achieve what they're setting out to do, um, keep, let's say, their board members happy or achieve their strategic imperatives or leave a great legacy, whatever it is. It's all about them and it's all about helping them get where they want to go. And this is very powerful in that respect because you can line it all up. Hmm. Uh, Sharon Blakely has listed her comment twice, so I, I really want to get to it if you don't mind. And okay. uh, What are some changes organizations should make to make cultural shifts to embrace the organizational excellence journey and an environment of CI or continuous improvement. Yeah. So any, anything high level that you could offer? I'm just, um, you know, I think if we take a look, if we just take kind of take a look at the global results. I mean, it's interesting that we see these strengths, you know, in leadership involvement and, and focus on the customer, but there's a vast difference between that and what's happening with the database decision making and and societal commitment or the um, the prevention based process management and so these are two areas that we really need to be working on and then as you if people download the study and they take a look at the other ratings across all of these best management practices I mean they're going to notice things that I'm going to be discussing this actually in a in a, a webinar on the later this month on the 27th but here's a sneak uh, preview you know we'll notice that one of the lowest practices in the work processes area is benchmarking or learning from others you know and and some of the other um, some of the other things that that came out of that is that we're not we're not paying attention to you know future oriented practices like contingency planning for unforeseen events for example and so this is really good to kind of take a look at that study and and you know think about your own organization but better yet do a self-assessment with your own organization uh, against the principles or, or you know, the full assessment that includes the practices as well to kind of see where you're sitting and where you need to do some work. And then you as a quality professional, I mean, you're there to assist. All right. And Mary has asked, hey, where do I get my hands on some of this documentation? Is there a link? And so if you don't mind, Don, I'm going to go ahead and, and steer this towards the closing gate and uh, okay. remind everyone that what will happen is an email will be sent out in within 24 hours and mm -hmm. that will have uh, your RUs that have been earned through participation in this webinar, it's point one. And uh, you'll also have the speaker, Don's email, which is listed on the screen as well. So if you have questions, it doesn't have to end here please feel free to go ahead and reach out. But, Don, on your website, Organizational Excellence Specialists CA, there are some, there's some reports for the, for the taking, correct? Oh, there's tons of stuff. I've tried to be so open and transparent. And to me, it's all about, you know, trying to get information out there to that 80% of the working population that, that doesn't know about all of this, uh, that can be used, you know, for their benefit. So you'll find the the site is very rich with resources that can be downloaded from the 240 page publication uh, wow. right through to that interrelations document that's a a great um, you know diagnostic to use. Our t you know our assessment tools are on there. The studies on there. There's all sorts of blogs, interesting blogs that have been written not only by myself but other people. And so we really try to make this. Um, as as relevant and as informative and beneficial as possible to the working population. So there's uh, 
it's chock full of great resources. So I would welcome you to um, to take a look through the site and take you know download what you want and and we even have um, a LinkedIn group where we try to keep people up to date on some of the great stuff that's going on around the world um, with in the excellence community with different excellence models and events and the latest breaking news on high performing organizations and so forth. Wow. So everybody can learn. It's all about learning and sharing and, and celebrating all the great work that's being done. Well, I certainly admire the, the openness of the, of the platform. That's wonderful. Yeah. So it's time to end today's program. Thank you again to our presenter, Don Ringrose, and to each and every one of you for your, your meaningful questions and your active participation. Uh, we wish you well, hope that you will stay in touch. And with that, we need to say goodbye for tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Don. Yes, thanks for hosting, Kurt. Wonderful. You're